So today we are going to talk about active detection scheme. So So let me consider, let me give you a scenario. So in the previous class, we were talking about different types of detection algorithms, uh, which, which had the following property. So we have uh, the H naught was my Y1 to Yn is distributed according to P0 and HA was Y1 to Yn is not distributed according to P0. And in some cases, P0 was known. In some cases, PA was, well, let me just, PA. And then we had considered the case of P0 known, PA known, then PA unknown, and then both of them unknown. Okay, so we consider these cases and one of the things we realized uh, was that this detection strategy is not robust to replay attack. So what is replay attack? I'm going to record my observations from the past two days, three days, four days. So the adversary is going to record the past three days of observation and it's just going to replay the same observation and again and again. Okay, so what happens in that situation is the actual state is not reaching to the attack detector. It's the past three days of information that is reaching to the attack detector. And the past three days of information is actually distributed according to P0 because there was no attack at that point of time. As a result of which, if I do a replay attack, there is no way for the detector to know whether it's an attack or it's not an attack because the distribution of the data remains the same as the unattacked data. So now the problem is we need to fix this issue. We need to fix, we need to figure out how do you detect an attack uh, even if the adversary is replaying the past data. So let me draw the diagram of what happens in a control system. I have the actuator, I have the plant, I have the sensor, I have x of t and then there is a channel and then there is the attacker. Then there is, this is your detector plus controller. which goes to the actuator. Let me write it in two sentences. write it here, this is UT. XT plus one, perfect. This is YT plus one. Or let me just write it as YT.
Okay, so let's think about it. So go back to the example of Ocean's Eleven movie. So you are the security, you're sitting in the security room and there are these people who want to, I don't know, steal something. What are, I don't know what they were stealing, but I guess it's some money or whatever. So the people are stealing money and so they are replaying the camera feed into the security room. So there is this, this is the, this is the corridor leading to the, I don't know, the money, money room. And there is a sensor, which is a camera. And so the camera is getting fed to the security room. So this is my security room. This is my camera. This is my corridor. And in this case, the actuator, there is no actuator as such, but if there is something wrong happening in the corridor, some security people will go and actuate the plant. I don't know. <laughs> Do something in the corridor to, to prevent something bad from happening. Okay, so that's the actuator component of this Ocean's Eleven movie. So now you are the director of Ocean's Eleven, or maybe you are the security person in Ocean's Eleven movie. And you think that the movie is very stupid, we need to do something more intelligent. Uh, how would you go about solving it? So you know that the attackers are going to replay the sensor feed. They're going to look at the camera feed from the last 20 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour or whatever, and they are just going to replay the same thing. So in the channel, the attacker is going to come, they are going to replace the camera feed, and so what you're seeing is YT, not XT. XT is the current camera feed, YT is like the camera feed from one hour ago, because that's what the attacker wanted to do. So your job is to detect that there is an attacker in the system. What would you do? I'm going to, I'm going to pause here for two minutes. I want you to really think this through. How do we make our system robust to replay attack? So let's come up with an idea. Let me, let me uh, give you a hint. So I am the security and I don't know if the, like the, the somebody is going to record the sensor and is going to feed me. So what I'll do is I will send a person in the corridor and or not a person, maybe person is too expensive. Uh, we don't have that much money. Uh, so we'll, we'll put a light, I don't know, a red color light in the corridor, or not a red color, but red, green, and yellow. And so every time the red will blink, and then the green will blink, and the yellow will blink. And then I will know maybe if I'm getting the data feed from the yesterday or from today. Uh, but there is a bit of a problem even in this case. Uh, what's the problem? So if I'm doing red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue, if this is a sequence, then even if I record the, even if the attacker records the whole thing and then replay it, it's very difficult to know if it is actually an attack signal or the true signal. Okay, so if I do red, green, blue, red, green, blue, it doesn't seem to help us. How will you help them? What will you do differently that will help them? How about I send the color information from the security room to the plant, and then as I'm getting the camera feed, I'm checking if I'm pressing the red button and I'm getting the red output or not, I'm pressing the green button and I'm getting the green output or not, and so on. <laughs> You should go and tell this to the director of Ocean's Eleven. 
we want Oceans 14 now. <laughs> They'll update it, update the movie. So this kind of idea is known as dynamic watermarking. Okay, so what are we doing in watermarking? In watermarking, we have the usual control strategy, or in this case, it's YT, because that's what the controller is observing. I'm going to add a small noise to the system. The property of this noise is, it's not like the attacker doesn't know that there is a red, that there is a red light, green light, and a blue light in the camera feed. The attacker knows about it. Attacker knows what the corridor looks like. Attacker knows that there is a camera in the corridor. So attacker knows everything about the system. The only thing the attacker doesn't know is when is the security person here going to press the red button, the green button, or the blue button. That information is only with the security. That's literally the only thing that is different between the attacker, the difference between the attacker and the security person. Okay, so ET, so uh, let me write it formally. So that's why it's an active detection because you are actively changing the actuation signal in order to detect the presence of an attack. So this is known as dynamic watermarking. This is known as dynamic watermarking where I'm actively changing the control action so as to detect whether an attack is happening or not happening. So what does the controller know? Watermarking algorithm. Control algorithm. System model. And what else does the controller know? And the watermark signal. E1, ET, and so on. Have we used E1, ET so far uh, in one of the lectures? Did we use ET for uh, residual calculation or did we use delta T? Can you go back and check if we have used ET before? For chi-square detection, we might have used ET or something. If not, then it's great. We can continue to use ET here. Error signal? Okay, so ET is used there. Okay, so I can't use ET. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L. No, L, M. WT is also used. I can't use for watermark. Uh, it's so irritating. Omega. Yeah. Omega is already used for uncertainty. Omega, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Theta T. Uh, th theta, have you used theta yet? Use for, for parameters. Yeah. C, C, okay. <laughs> Good. C1, CT. CT. So actuator knows one, two, three but not four. No, not actuator, adversary.
Okay. So you can see that the adversary is very, very intelligent. Not just adversary knows the watermarking algorithm, like what algorithm is generating this psi t. It knows the control algorithm, which is this gamma. So adversary knows what gamma is. It knows the system model, which is this plant model, whatever is the state transition function of this plant. And the sensor, the sensor that is uh, reading the plant information. The only thing that the controller knows more than adversary is the actual realization of this random variable, C1 to Ct. So the controller knows here what color light needs to be lit at every point of time, but the, the attacker doesn't know that sequence of, of light uh, inputs in the corridor. Okay. Why do you think that this is reasonable? It is reasonable to assume that the adversary knows one, two, and three. Any reason to believe that the adversary knows one, two, and three? The adversary knows the watermarking algorithm, control algorithm, and system model. So you know, if you look at any industrial plant, uh, what you will notice is that there is a manual that comes with the plant. So with everything, there is a manual. There is a manual for the air conditioning system. There is a manual for this thermostat. There is a manual for that camera. There is a manual for everything. And that manual is actually a public information, right? Everybody can get access to the manual for the air conditioning system that is running this building. And the manual will spell out what is the algorithm, what is the control logic, System model, not too difficult to deduce based on the input-output characteristics. For a lot of different things, the system model is very well known. Um, if you look at a vehicle, you can plug in something to your OBD port, um, and you can collect all the information on the CAN bus that is coming on the CAN bus. So you can deduce the system model from that. So system model is also not that difficult. Control algorithm is not too difficult. Watermarking algorithm is not too difficult. A lot of this you can spend some time uh, reading the manual, talk to people, and in some case when you have like uh, people who are working for a specific nation state, uh, they can in fact build the entire system in their backyard and they can test it out. You can actually build. So if you go back to the Ocean's Eleven movie, they basically talk to people to figure out what, what happens, right? They, they talk to the security guards and other people. They've been to the, the hotel themselves or the casino themselves, and then they figure out what exactly the system is trying to do, right? So they, they did all of this in order to figure out what the watermarking algo is, control algo is, and system model is. Okay. So this is known as dynamic watermarking. So let's look at it from two different perspectives. Uh, actually, uh, one question that I, one, one thing I wanted to point out, what happens in the dynamic water algorithm is as follows. I'm going to add plus one here, so because I want to look at the current action and then the future state. So you have this CT that gets added to the control signal that CT goes through the actuator, then gets in onto the plant. Then the plant transforms this combined signal in a specific manner, and then the sensor is going to pick up that particular uh, transformation, and is going to output XT plus one. If the attacker changes the signal from XT plus one to YT plus one, then what the detector is supposed to do is look for the signal introduced due to CT in XT plus one. If it sees that in the observation, I don't see the transformation of this particular signal through the plant, then it means that it's been attacked. If it doesn't see it, then it's not attacked. So that's the over underlying algorithm. That's what we are trying to detect in this particular uh, situation. So what we are doing is forcing a correlation between these two quantities.
So adding this CT forces the correlation between XT and uh, UT and that's the correlation you are looking for and if you don't see the correlation then it means that the system has been attacked. So let's study the model, the mathematical model for this algorithm. So let's look at the linear system model. I have xt plus 1, axt plus but plus wt, and I have yt equals to c of x of t plus vt. And now I'm going to add an attack signal AT. AT is the attack. This is the sensor noise. Under the usual circumstances, my ut is supposed to be gamma t of yt plus, e, uh, sorry, just gamma t of yt. In the dynamic watermarking, my ut equals gamma of yt plus ct and ct is mean zero and very small covariance, epsilon covariance, Gaussian vector. How many of you have seen Game of Thrones? Game of Thrones, kind of. So in older days, whenever you were sending a document and you didn't want the document to be forced, what you will do is put a seal. You put a little bit of uh, uh, wax and then you put a seal on top of it and then it gets sealed. Now if somebody tampers with it, the receiving party will know easily that the seal has been tampered with and so they will know that the, 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 whole, uh, the whole information has been corrupted. You can think of this as the seal, okay? CT acts as a seal that needs to be detected at the time of observation. Okay. Cool. So, uh, what we do in dynamic watermarking, so you don't have to be doing dynamic watermarking all the time, but uh, there are occasions, like as soon as you feel that something is wrong, you can start using dynamic watermarking. On the other hand, you can always have a system that's always running dynamic watermarking because it's a small perturbation to your actual action. So let me give you a more concrete example. Let's say you are driving a vehicle on a highway, okay? And uh, your lane keeping assist is on, and your, your, your vehicle is trying as much as possible to stay at the center of the lane. And you're going on a straight highway, okay? Now your steering system is hacked, let's say, okay? And your steering system is hacked and you want to detect whether the, uh, there is an attack happening on your steering system or not. What will you do? 
what you will do is in your control action you will add a small noise what does adding a small noise to your steering system mean sorry that's right so you, in the usual case you will be doing like you'll be sitting like this all the time at the time of dynamic watermarking you are just doing a little bit of motion left to right right to left and it's supposed to be random okay so sometimes you're moving left sometimes you are using right but the attacker will not will never be able to know what move you are going to have next and what you're going to do is you're going to make the observation if you're turning the vehicle right is the vehicle turning right or not if you're turning the vehicle left, is the vehicle turning left or not, right? And, but the critical thing here is you need to make sure that your vehicle remains within the lane boundaries. You don't cross over to the other lane. Well, you can do that as well, but then you'll have to be careful about the cars on the, on the nearby lanes. So anyways, that's roughly how dynamic watermarking works. So in the vehicle example in the lane, by the way, most car companies are extremely critical. The most critical subsystem that they have is the lane keeping assist system. And the reason is uh, if you have cars coming up from this side and your car is going on the other side, this kind of head-on collision can happen if your lane keeping assist is not doing its job correctly. So it's one of the most critical system in a vehicle. Or if your road is curving, your lane keeping assist is supposed to steer you along the curve. So lane keeping assist is the most critical component. You can have fault in the longitudinal motion of the car, but that's okay because you will crash with the cars that are going in the same direction. And therefore it's not, I mean, it's going to cause some damage, but not a se severe damage. But if your lane keeping assist fails, then it's a severe damage to the vehicle. So anyways, uh, uh, there are critical subsystems and within those critical subsystems you might have some constraints like for instance you cannot move into the other lane you have to do whatever you want to do you have to do it within your own lane and so that whenever you are applying this kind of noise small noise remember that the small noise is a Gaussian noise so it can be unbounded but you always have to use some sort of saturation in order to make sure that this whole thing is bounded okay within the constraints of the environment whatever the constraints environment may have let's go back to this rooms example so suppose i want to detect whether this particular temperature sensor is being spoofed or not how will you detect that through dynamic watermarking what would the ct equivalent be in the case of this room how will you use dynamic watermarking in this room so in the case of a car, you are going left and right because it's a lane keeping assist. In the case of this room, you will pump in a little bit of cold air, a little bit of hot air every now and then, and you will see whether the temperature is going up or going down. That's the way to dynamically watermark the temperature reading of this room. Okay, so UT, you are changing the action. You are adding noise to your action. So in the case of this room, the action is pumping cold air or pumping hot air and you're just going to add a little bit of noise to that particular action. Okay, so once you add the noise, what you're going to do is, uh, the H naught is basically YT is generated from gamma yt plus ct and the alternate hypothesis is yt is generated from well not generated from let me just write it Okay, 
So this is the hypothesis that we would like to test in the case of dynamic watermarking for linear system. You can pretty much do the same thing for nonlinear systems as well, right? It's just that the test statistics will be quite complicated for nonlinear systems. So for linear systems, we can come up with the test statistics, the residual based test statistics that you know, we have already studied. So in the next class, I'm going to cover that particular test statistics and tell you how exactly dynamic watermarking is used. Uh, uh, but for nonlinear systems, uh, you can essentially use the same algorithm, but uh, the same, same method of dynamic watermarking, and you can set up the hypothesis in exactly this way. It's just that the equations are not going to look clean, and so you might have to use some of the other test statistics that we have talked about so far. So this is for the linear system. Now I'll talk about, there are situations where your action is, so remember in this case, the action ut belongs to Rm. But you could have ut which belongs to the set on off, right? So I can either turn on a switch or I can turn off the switch. What does it mean to add a Gaussian noise to this on and off system? It's impossible, right? A Gaussian noise, this CT lies in RM. And there is no way to add on off system, a switch system to a vector in RM. So we need to figure out how to uh, work with the situation where UT doesn't take a value in the Euclidean space, it takes a value in a discrete set. So let's look at that particular problem. Any questions so far before I erase everything? Okay. Awesome. So now I have finite space Markov decision. Problem. So, what is finite space, finite action, uh, Markov decision problem? My xt plus 1 equals to ft of, or maybe f of xt, ut, wt, and yt equals to g of x t v t and then I'm going to add additional term comma a t. But x t is discrete and action set is discrete in this case. So my state looks like a discrete set of uh, uh, readings and then my action is also very discrete. So action could be on off, it could be on off of five switches. So if you have U is, if you have five switches to control, I have five on off switches. What exactly is the value of M? Can you tell me? I have two actions and I have five switches. So M is actually equals to two raised to five. So I have 32 actions, okay? At every point of time, I have two actions and there are five such actuators. So I have uh, 32 possible combinations of on off combinations of the five items. This is the case, by the way, for this air handling unit inside the room. So the air handling unit can only have, most likely, it can only have an on-off situation. 
So when it is on, it is pumping a lot of air into the room. Oh, actually the, the air conditioning system you might have at your own home, it might only have two different states, on or off. Uh, I had to replace my air conditioning system a few years back. And so it had actually three states. It was off, then it was medium, and then it was high. It had three states in that particular situation. Now my question is, how do you do dynamic watermarking in this space, in this particular problem? So I have an air conditioning system, and there are only three actions that I can pick. Either I turn off, I put it on medium fan, or I put it on very high fan. Those are the only three options I have. How will you do dynamic watermarking in that case? Oh, and I can also have cool or heat. Okay, so let's do AC system. So there U equals to off. This is basically the fan thing. So medium, high. Heat, cool. And you can also have neutral actually. So neutral is you are neither heating nor cooling, you are just running the fan throughout the house. So this is the fan speed and this is the heat exchanger. This is the, uh, you have nine different combinations of actions. So three there and three here. So you can have off in the heating mode, you can have medium in the heating mode, you can have high in the heating mode and same thing, so on and so forth. So you have so many different options in your air conditioning system. So what are you going to do? How are you going to run dynamic watermarking in this case? Well, the idea is that instead of, uh, like you cannot really apply uh, uh, a Gaussian noise to this particular system, but what you can do is randomize between all of these different options you have, okay? Now the question is, uh, if you are doing this randomization, if you are in the peak summer, will you do randomization with heat on? Probably not. If you are in peak winter, Will you do randomization with cooling on? Probably not. So depending on the state of the system, you will have a bunch of actions, possible actions, and you want to randomize across those options. Okay? So if it is, if you are, if you are in the peak of the summer, uh, you want to keep your cool on, so the, the heat exchanger will always be in the cool mode or the neutral mode. And then you can randomize between off, medium and high. Okay? At every point of time you can maybe keep it high and then you turn it off, you turn it off for like two minutes, then you go to the medium for one minute, then you turn it on, on high for two minutes and so on and so forth. You can keep switching back and forth across different actions. and. Uh, you can pretty much maintain the same temperature inside the house, but you will know if your AC is getting attacked or not. Although I really don't know who's going to attack your AC. Nobody did that while I was at my home ever. But it is possible, by the way. It's not uh, impossible to actually attack the AC. Um, I had a smart thermostat, so technically whoever knows the API key for my smart thermostat can remotely change the temperature. So in fact, I used to do this. <laughs> I got the API key from my thermostat system and I would sit in the basement and I would change the temperature for the thermostat using a post command. And then my wife is like, who turned on the heat or who turned on the cooling? And I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> I did it <laughs> through an API. <laughs> Don't turn mad at me. So anyways, it's possible to do it, right? So in, in today's uh, smart thermostat era, it is possible to do it. It's just that nobody has figured out a reason to attack. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, 
I did read somebody attacking the fans, the smart fans, but anyways, I don't know why somebody would do that. But it's possible to attack some of these uh, smart devices that you have at your home. Okay. So in this case, you define your control action as follows. Your UT is distributed according to gamma of X, gamma of YT. Uh, let me put one minus beta. Gamma of YT plus beta times nu. Uh, this is the, so what is nu? Nu is a function that maps y to a distribution over u. This is nu by the way. And then gamma is also a function from y to a distribution over u. This is probability distributions over u, probability distribution over u. So I'm, I'm mixing between two policies. One is the usual control policy that I pick. So if it is summer, I'm going to cool it. If it is winter, I'm going to heat it. There is some policy. The temperature is above certain limit, then do this. Temperature is below certain limit, do that. So that's the usual policy. Plus, I'm going to add, beta is a small number. Beta is a small number, greater than zero. And I'm going to perturb the original policy that I have with uh, another randomized policy. So this is known as a randomized policy. Okay, so this is what you will do in the case of uh, the finite space Markov decision problem where X is finite set, U is finite set. Then the way you pick your action is by mixing your original policy with a small watermarked policy, a watermarked randomized policy. And the randomized policy and the original policy, both of them are actually mapping the observation to a distribution over the action. Gamma is also mapping observation to a distribution over the action. And remember, P of U is just a vector, P1 to PM. This is just a vector. So what you're doing is just adding two vectors with a mixing coefficient of, I mean, not the mixing coefficient, but beta is like the weight of which policy is weighed how much. So you have nu, which is a vector, nu which is a vector at yt, gamma which is a vector at yt, and you're just mixing the two. You get a bunch of probability distributions and you use that probability distribution to generate your action and that is the action you implement on the system. So that's dynamic watermarking in the context of finite Markov decision problems. The one for the linear system is very well known. People have been studying it for uh, I think 10 plus, maybe 12 plus years. There are lots of classes of dynamic watermarking algorithm now. The finite MDP problem is something that we have, uh, we have solved in our group. One of my PhD students solved it. Now he, uh, he's in GE as a research scientist. He works on cybersecurity of wind farms. Uh, so he was the one who came up with this algorithm that we will be talking about in the subsequent classes. And uh, it's, uh, it's in review at this point of time. So. Uh, so we wrote the first paper on the finite MDP setting. 
So that's all I have for today. What, uh, in the next class, I'm going to talk about dynamic watermarking for linear systems. Uh, that's on Monday, so there is no class on Friday. The fr Friday class is canceled. Uh, so on Monday, I'll talk about dynamic watermarking for linear systems, the one that was the first formulation. And then on Wednesday, I'll talk about dynamic watermarking for a finite MDP. And then we'll talk about uh, some other detection algorithms. Thank you. Uh, have a good weekend.